Welcome everybody. I'm Sarah Walker, the Walden Woods Projects Education Coordinator. Thank you so much for joining us for our conversation this evening with Nathaniel Popkin and Gail Straub. For those that do not know who we are, the Walden Woods Project is a nonprofit based out of Lincoln, Massachusetts. We preserve the land, literature, and legacy of Henry David Thoreau to foster an ethic of environmental stewardship and social responsibility. Our organization was founded in 1990 by recording artist Don Henley, and this past April we celebrated our 30th anniversary. So before we start, just to go over some Zoom housekeeping, although everyone is probably very used to this by now, uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so you are only able to see myself and the panelists. Um, feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to correspond immediately with each other. Um, if anyone is having tech difficulties, feel free to chat me. I'll do my best to help. Um, there will be a live audience Q&A during the last 20 to 25 minutes of the event. So feel free to enter any questions for Gail or Nathaniel throughout the presentation in the Q&A box, which is to the right on the screen. Um, and we'll get to those later. So tonight, again, we are joined by Nathaniel Popkin, who is a Philadelphia-based writer, editor, and historian. He is the author of Song of the City, The Possible City, Lion and Leopard, Philadelphia, Finding the Hidden City, and Everything is Borrowed. He's the co-editor of Who Will Speak for America. He was the co-founder of the web magazine Hidden City Daily and was the founding reviews editor of Cleaver Magazine. His literary criticism and essays has, have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Gulf Coast, Kenyon Review, Lit Hub, Tablet, Public Books, Rain Taxi, and many other publications. And we will be discussing his newest book tonight, To Reach the Spring, From Complicity to Consciousness in the Age of Eco-Crisis. As of today, the book is now for sale, so we hope you'll buy a copy. And we recommend using bookshop.org to order it. And I'll post that link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, moderating the discussion with Nathaniel is Gail Straub. And Gail is the author of six books, including the best-selling Empowerment, the critically acclaimed The Rhythm of Compassion, and the award-winning Ashokan Way, Landscape's Path into Consciousness. She co-directs the Empowerment Institute, where for over four decades, she has offered her work to hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. She co-founded Imagine, a global initiative for the empowerment of women currently in Africa, Afghanistan, India, and the Middle East. So with that, welcome Gail and welcome Nathaniel. Thank you, Sarah. It's so great to be here. Thank you to the Walden Woods Project for having me and to Gail for, for leading us forward. Thank you, Sarah. And Nathaniel, it's a great honor. And first, congratulations. The book launched. Thank you so today. much. Today and, is the day. Uh, today is the day. And even though you have seven or eight books already, it's still it's still a big moment. So bravo. And thank you. We have so, so many questions for you. And as Sarah said, we've left plenty of time for our audience too. But I thought, Nathaniel, I would start by reading this very short endorsement I gave your book because it yeah. says what I felt when I read your book, your amazing book last August. So here's what I said, friends, on the, on the webinar tonight. To reach the spring is a tour de force, both an incisive reckoning with the full magnitude of the climate emergency, along with a visionary understanding of how and why we have come to this place. I read this book with an unruly range of emotions and states of mind, including shame, unspeakable grief, existential dread, curiosity, insight, admiration for the author, but finally, most of all, hope. By illuminating how our reverence for the earth is intrinsically connected to our capacity to hope and to heal, leading to an inexorable yearning to act, Nathaniel Popkin has offered us a way forward. This book is essential reading for anyone who cares about our future. 
So, Nathaniel, let's jump into the heart of the beast. You say the, our, our, our escalating eco-crisis, the, the COVID epidemic pandemic is going to pale in comparison to this. I agree with that. How do you explain our society's failure to act? What has happened? Well, first, thank, thank you, Gail, for, um, for reading the book and uh, agreeing to read it and respond to it. I'm so appreciative for your reading, for your deep and careful reading of the book. It makes such a difference um, to try to understand where I'm trying to go with this book. So how to explain this, what seems inexplicable, that is that we have known for at least since the midway point of the 20th century, scientists and government officials have known that man-made burning of fossil fuels was changing the climate. And, it, and there was already evidence and it was clear. And regular people have known this to, from, a, from starting in the 1980s. And increasingly as time has gone on uh, into the 21st century, it has now been very clear for a very long time, decades, that our way of life based on the burning of fossil fuels, based on global extractive capitalism, is causing not just a climate emergency, because the climate is only really just one part of what's happening here. And I, I want to be clear about that. That's why, the, that's why this is about what I call an, uh, you know, the eco-crisis. That is, it's a, it's a series of interlocked thing, interconnected things that are happening to the earth that we inhabit. And part of that is climate. So we've known this. So if you know you're doing harm to something, you know that you're causing harm to yourself, your family, your children, other people, why don't you stop? And so part of what I'm trying to do with this book is interrogate the, the landscape of that emotion and that sort of psychological profile that is we haven't stopped. And in fact, we've actually made things quite a lot worse in the time period that we've known quite exactly what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's really, really important to separate out the individual's personal responsibility, discrete personal life, your responsibility mm -hmm. for something that is so slow moving vast in time and space scale. And that is of collective responsibility. That is what I do matters only if what you do matters. And so it's really complicated. But what has happened is because it's so complicated and there's community, there's people, families, communities, governments, there are 50,000 government entities in the United States alone it's very hard to find that spot where we can say we're going to stop. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of all of this is extraction, global extraction capitalism. And that's a system that is impossible even to imagine, trying to imagine, as I say in the book, all of the money in the world, making all the money in the world. You can't, can't get that. So this is a really challenging thing. And the, the result of which is that we are paralyzed to, to act. And part of this is because there's been no government leadership and that, and, and government is very complicated and there are competing interests and there are interests that have much more power than other interests. So part of what I tried to do with this book is to find a way to cut into that, mm -hmm. to understand all of that, and to find a way to, to think through at the personal moral level and the societal moral level, how to reconcile, how to come to terms with it, 
how to grieve for it, and how to act. And, and that's the goal here. So what, one of the things I found most original and most compelling was exactly what you've just alluded to. You, you went at this, Nathaniel, on so many levels and so many intersecting levels. Could you unpack for us a bit a, a, a little more how the moral, economic, political, environmental levels intersect? Sure. So, I mean, we, we're, we're all citizens, right? And, and so, and we all make, we're, we live in a society that is deeply based on the idea and the imagined ideal of personal choice in, in, in all aspects, right? And so we do feel like we, we have will and we have control over what we do and we have uh we are moral beings so we do think about what we do in in moral terms we try to do right and wrong we all do i mean we try to do right instead of wrong that's part of who we are but we're embedded into a society that has at a, a different way of assessing morality and moral risk and um and really if you and i were to say you know and i asked this question what is a life worth mm -hmm. what is, how do we value life we would say well we value it deeply and we would think about all the ways in which we value it and of course in a in a medical sense you know we try to do everything we can to save someone's life but the global capitalist system that we live in and that we're in, our politics is based in reacting to and aligning with and that we are embedded ourselves in as owners, investors, consumers, all the like, particularly as consumers, most of us, that, um, that assesses a moral value very differently. And in fact, every day decides whose life is valuable and whose life is not valuable. So what I'm, what I've tried to do by using different like frameworks of thinking throughout the book is help us see what's really happening here. The first framework is to think about COVID and the way um, in the very beginning, there were quite a lot of Republican politicians who said, sacrifice grandma, let's get back to work. And that seemed to a lot of us to be um, morally horrendous, you know, and it seemed horrifying. And, and yet, it's quite exactly what we do when we decide to, say, buy diamonds or mahogany or what, you know, the list goes on. Yeah. Or, or, put, or who gets put at risk because of, of uh, the change in climate. And so, on the other hand, we are all human beings and people who care deeply about the world we live in. So, at some point, we have to find a way to break free from that. And so that's why I bring in thinking through what ordinary Germans relationship was to the, to the Nazi regime and the Holocaust and how that relates. My way of starting the conversation is to sort of think about myself and, and to me a future grandchild, very far off into the future, and the world that I've left for that future person. And, and that's, I'm just trying to look for ways in so that we can actually talk about this. And um, I think later you're going to read from that, that right. part of the book, which I've told you moved me so deeply. But one of the things you, you talked about, I'd love you to touch on, say something as simple as our inability to communicate well in daily life. There, there are very everyday mundane things that point to our inability to face into this larger crisis. Can, can you connect some of our sort of mundane everyday actions with this vast over, overwhelming crisis? Well, part of it is that it, if we try to talk about it, we will end up condemning ourselves. Yeah. And yet, 
And I think we can do that. We can condemn ourselves and learn from that condemnation. You know, this is what a lot of religions help people. Each, you know, every religion has a version of, of doing that, of looking internally and thinking about the way one has acted and, and adjusting in that regard. So that we have that possibility, except the problem here is that the responsibility is so vastly dispersed. And that if we try to take it on ourselves, we end up thinking about very kind of small and pithy and sort of like, uh, you know, we each have our individual peccadilloes about what we allow ourselves to do and don't allow ourselves to do. And, and they're all ridiculous because what you do or what I do or what Sarah does in our daily life, like, it simply doesn't really matter. I mean, I'll put a check on that because in, in one way it can matter. But um, so we really struggle in this, this gulf between the way we're set up to do, which is to live morally and to assess ourselves morally and what we can control here. Mm. At the same time, I think we're so embedded into the system that we live in particularly as consumers that we can't we can't get out of it and part of the problem with the consumer society is that there's no secondary or alternative or um, contradictory voices out there mm -hmm. who are saying and I say this sort of as a joke in the book I mean why is if you think about the number of car advertisements that one encounters each day on television but you never see an advertisement for saying, you know, why don't you walk to work today? You know, why, why don't you, um, why don't you take it easy on the earth today and use your broom instead of that, that gas powered leaf blower, you know? So like, there's no counter programming whatsoever. There's psychologically, we're only, we are, we're, we're filled with propaganda about a certain way of life that's based on the fossil fuel and it's unrelenting. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, we're, we really are complicit, but we really ne can't necessarily be held responsible because we're filled with propaganda yeah. over and over again. So it's a strange between a rock and a hard place. We are complicit and yet there's very few ways out. Though I am going to circle back. This book is enormously hopeful in the end and we're, we're, I want to assure <laughs> our, our webinar <laughs> friends that uh, we're going to come back to that and also they might be curious what you think they can do but before we do that so the elephant in the room is 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 covid and you had this quote uh in the book where you had it was from cnn and you had this neurosurgeon this health reporter sanjay gupta and he said on cnn how I behave affects your health. How you behave affects my health. Never have we been so dependent on each other, at least not in my lifetime. And we should rise to that occasion. So, Nathaniel, has COVID changed our capacity to act, to understand, to rise to the occasion? I think I think yes, Gail. Uh, I think there's there's there are reasons to be worried and there are reasons to be excited. Mm. The first, the f and actually mostly reasons to be excited and 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 positively hopeful, based upon what we've seen. Although the response has been desperately uneven, but as Sarah and I were talking about, you know, it's it's hard to isolate out the the propagandic. Um, influence of the of the president and his party in the minds of Americans. If that didn't exist, would we have really seen the capacity for cooperative and collective and collaborative behavior to tackle something that is real but also distant, not just about me and my family, but perhaps about you and your family and everyone else. And despite all of the noise, a significant percentage of Americans, just talking about Americans in this moment, have adjusted their behavior. Mm -hmm. 
have adjusted many of their behaviors, have come to see why it's it, acting, changing one's behavior is, is about a collective well-being. Mm -hmm. And so if we can do this now, well, it's a little bit of a dry run because what we will be facing in a decade or two, of course, could unleash more pandemics as well, but we'll see places that are becoming uninhabitable. We'll see many more storms and difficult fires and all of this kind of thing. Emergencies. The, the other way I, I, I see it, and this was pointed out to be to me by my friend Sandra, um, she asked me, and we were talking about this, you know, why is it that we have learned to trust scientists in terms of COVID, wow. which we have. Yeah. We, I mean, if it wasn't for the Republican noise, we would basically pretty much be trusting in science, but, but we can't and we don't. I mean, the models have been created by um, ecologists and those who track climate and, and and we know what, in fact, a dam will do when it's put into a river. The scientists know, and they've been telling it to us for decades now, but we, we haven't quite found a way to elevate and privilege their voices over the other voices in regard to the planet. And so, but if we can do it for a pandemic that threatens our lives and our health and our well-being, well, then maybe for sure we can do it uh, with the earth. Wow. So in a, in a strange way, it's like an existential dress rehearsal or <laughs> terrible way to put it. I, I think so. I mean, I'm, I, it is, it, it is a, a, a dress rehearsal and, you know, uh, some societies have passed and others yeah. have failed. Well said. So, some really have done well and some surprising ones have done well, actually. Yes. Okay, would you read to us your I would gorgeous, love to. gorgeous writing? And, 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 and before I do, Gail, I just want, I'm going to hold up your uh, most recent book, <laughs> The Ashokan Way, and, and because it's such a beautiful book, and, and some of the ideas that you posit in this book, of course, they relate quite a lot to what I'm thinking about. about and we'll get into some of this about nature and what yeah. nature means. Yeah. But I, I just want uh, everyone to be aware of Gail's book too, which is also available on Oh, you're, you're really a darling. Thank you, Nathaniel. So um, read, read to us. I will read. Oh, and I, you know, I set it up so I wouldn't even have to use the old fashioned book. I could just do it on my screen. Yeah, that's good. It's a lot easier. So, so the book has a preface, but right after the preface is really the beginning of the book and, um, or it, in its original form, I'm not telling you not to read the preface. Please do. It's important. No, it's important. Um, mm -hmm. So what Gail is asking me to read is called A Letter with an Unknown Destination. And I'm going to read a few little parts of it because we don't have, you don't want to hear me read forever. Uh, I'm going to read some parts of it. It starts with an epigraph, uh, which goes like this. There are always gaps in our sheaf of light and always behind the mysteries which the rays have penetrated stand others, still shrouded in darkness. And that's from J. Henri Fabre, uh, a really 19th century writer from his book called The Sacred Beetle and Others. So it goes like this. My dear future grandchild, you do not exist. You may never exist. Nevertheless, this letter concerns the measure of your existence, its possibility and its peril. I hope you don't mind. Your parent, whichever of my two children it might be, may be uncomfortable with this speculative exercise. They are students enraptured by the world in all its strangeness and familiarity. And the truth is you are the farthest thing from their minds. But I can't say to you, let's just keep this to ourselves. The possibility and peril of your future, of your future world are theirs just the same. It's mine too, though by the time the climate has warmed so much that it has substantially destabilized, I will be a very old man. When you are my age and I am long gone, global temperatures will have increased another degree and a half Fahrenheit, or more than three degrees from the pre-industrial norm, and large parts of the earth may be uninhabitable. I did this to you, 
and so did my parents and grandparents. All the carbon dioxide we felt it necessary to emit is a down payment on your terror. Your own parents are not innocent. How did we let this happen? How did we go on living normally as we have, even attentively as we have, yet without taking action? Many of us have known with increasing depth of understanding and mounting clarity, at least since 2005, that's when Elizabeth Colbert's three-part series, The Climate of Man, appeared with the stubborn certainty of a pregnancy test in The New Yorker. I can still see the three magazines open to the article on the wooden bedside table in our old bedroom, exasperating, incomprehensible, unbearable proof. As best as can be determined, Colbert wrote in part one of the series, the world is now warmer than it has been at any point in the last two millennia. And if current trends continue, by the end of the century, it will likely be hotter than at any point in the last two million years. So I'm going to skip a, a little bit uh, ahead and read two parts from the end of this letter. The unraveling of interconnected ecological systems will strain the food supply and send more people, there are already some 65 million today, into some kind of exile. Uh, you know this. I just want you to know we did too. We have robbed you, your parents, our own children, perhaps just the same, of the stability that forgiveness requires. You won't have the luxury to grant it. Perhaps you will condemn us instead. The chapters that follow this letter are an act of struggle. I want you to know that I did struggle. And in that struggle, I kept searching for words, visions, metaphors, past events, intellectual frameworks, theories, pulses of language from now and any time to help harbor the burden. How to live long how to live alongside disaster. Truth is, we leave the balcony doors open much of the time. The rain comes in and warps the floorboards. After a summer of rain, they feel underfoot soft as sand. Mold has started growing on the ceiling of the little bathroom. I smelled it several times before I looked up and saw the black spores in the first propulsive stitches of a tapestry. The musk choked me even to take a pee. We brought your parent up here in this house, your father or possibly your mother, with the windows and doors open. Over the years, the neighbor's gray cat has wandered in and a yellow bird and wafts of marijuana and drum beats and sirens and giant flies. We let that world in for a reason, for it was the true world, and it would be dishonest to deny it. Far be, from us, far be it from us to shelter our children. But the mold in the bathroom, that's the thing. It has to go. The belief that we can't live with the mold, that we have to undertake heroic acts to abolish it, finds favor in science. Black mold can kill. Yet the instinct to destroy the bathroom spores is the same instinct that's created the ecological crisis, the instinct to subdue other living forms for our own benefit. I'm not sure how we reconcile this either, when it must seem to you, my dear, that because of that instinct, everything is out of control. The poet, the Iranian poet, Farouk Farakzad wrote, I hear the age that has lost its heart, the idleness of so many hands, the alienation in so many faces. But, she wrote, she won't become alienated from the garden, the garden which she has written about and which I referenced earlier. Love and justice must be possible and through them healing. I am forlorn, she writes, and imagine it is possible to take the garden to a hospital. I imagine, I imagine. And the garden's heart has swollen in the heat of this sun, its mind 
slowly drains of its lush memories. Maybe you too are sitting in a garden and though the pond is empty and the people scattered in desperation or self-deception, you are there to face it. It gives me joy to think that you might be inclined as I am to stick your hands in the earth no matter if it is drained of all memory of what had grown there before. Perhaps the wisdom to dig your fingers inside the body of this dying planet becomes an overpowering instinct toward healing. Our family produces determined people and no small number who have faced adversity with grace. Among them like you, I imagine, are seekers of justice. With love from the edge of reason, your grandfather. Thank you. Oh, just gorgeous. Thank you, Nathaniel. Wow. Oh, so, so glad that everyone participating and who will hear the recording can hear you read. And I hope, are you going to read this book on audio? It, it is uh, literally today. The files were uh, mastered and it will be available on Audible. I presume tomorrow, very, very shortly. So if you prefer to listen to a book, which a lot of people do nowadays, uh, it will be available in the voice of the author, which now you're familiar with. Uh, <laughs> and um, if hopefully that's a positive thing for you. Uh, and if so, in a few days, you'll be able to order it and, and listen to the whole thing. Fantastic. And I'm so, so glad you read it. I'm so, so glad. Okay, so we have time for a few more questions before uh, Sarah op opens the floor to all the people listening. So um, let's get to this hope business, Nathaniel. So <laughs> the epigraph of this book, which blew me away, reads, today here our only purpose is to reach the spring. Primo Levi in If This Is a Man. So in the end, your book is hopeful. And you trace in the most remarkable way how our reference for the word, the earth is connected to our capacity to hope and to heal. And that leads to action. Please talk to us more about this. Yes, yeah, so um, in this is a, uh, and if this is a man uh, by Primo Levi, um, which is a memoir of uh, time in Auschwitz, um, Levi characterizes life in the concentration camp so immeasurably well. Earlier in the book, I take some time to think about the relationship of something like the Holocaust and those who perpetrated it and those who went along with it to those of us who are sort of going along with what we're doing. And when I say what we're doing to the earth, I mean to other human beings, ourselves, and there are almost 9 million other species of animals and plants on earth. We're doing it to them too. But so we come to Levy and uh, to help us get out of that mode of of um, of giving up and and it's 1944 or maybe it's early 1945 and it's winter in the concentration camp in Auschwitz and sometimes they can get out and look across the road outside the fence and what is visible in the landscape there and also inside the camp is utterly gray, brown, and it evokes death all the way around. And Levy uses a description of the mechanisms of death inside the concentration camp to express the ways in which metaphorically it speaks to the death of earth. And the death of earth therefore becomes the death of hope. But lo and behold, one early spring day, he notices across the way the possibility of green. And in fact, he sees green. And 
that alone triggers the sensibility that it might be possible to survive mentally, physically, physiologically, emotionally through hope. That the spring might in fact come and maybe he knew and maybe he didn't know that a real spring was in fact coming and that when spring came in 1945 and when it finally fully came into blossom, he would be saved and many others would be as well. And so for him, there, there is a, the, the metaphor is real, in other words. That is that spring as a metaphor for hope is hope. And for us to believe that, that we can heal the earth for ourselves and for future generations, and not just for human beings, but for the creatures that live inside us and alongside of us, that we can heal the earth for them comes from nature itself, the great teacher. And, and Gail, you take so much time in your book to think through the ways in which nature teaches us. It teaches us about death, as Primo Levi saw in the middle of the winter that everything was about death outside and it teaches us about life, those two opposites that we can hold together at the same time. And our experience of nature signals inside of us and signals to us in a physical way, like we can feel it when we're in it. There's a reason why tree huggers are called tree huggers, because you can hug a tree <laughs> and, and, it, and you can feel the tree's energy by doing so. so Nature then is the thing that we need to save nature, even though the concept of saving nature is itself problematic and one in which I kind of interrogate throughout the book because it, it gives us perhaps a little bit too much agency than we deserve as, as creatures. But, but still, for our own selves, to believe that it's possible that what I laid out there in that letter to that grandchild well, maybe it, will, maybe it will come about just as it's described, but also maybe that's okay. Or maybe it doesn't have to end up that way, but that we are able to hook on to something. And that is what nature gives us. It's so beautifully stated. I mean, there is an intrinsic relationship between reverence and responsibility. I, I believe that. Um, and here we are with the Walden project. What better way of, of, of reverence, you know? It's yeah, just that, just that response. Say you can, oh, go ahead, sir. Sorry, you can hear no, no, you know, Thoreau um, echoing both both works. So it's it's cool to see. Well, it really, I mean, it really is amazing to launch this book, though we are remote. <laughs> I could, I like to pretend that I'm, you know, Walden right now. <laughs> and as a young man um, or a, a young kid, as a, a lot of people, one comes to a conscious, consciousness about the earth and humanity through reading certain things. I mean, I think we read Thoreau in ninth grade, and that was one of those things another person who I read who often doesn't get mentioned too much in this regard, a more um, contemporary figure is Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. Um, and I talk about my reading of Douglas in this book and what it meant to me as a 15 year old. Uh, this was the first Supreme uh, environmentalist Supreme Court Justice mm -hmm. and um, who had an incredible reverence for the mountains of Washington state. And that is precisely what triggered in, in him the notion that we have the responsibility for protecting the earth for ourselves because, it, because we can't live without it because in a, in a real way, should we lose, you know, when you, when you mine mountaintop mine a mountain you're you're cutting off a limb of your own self right and that's how he would have thought about it 
Absolutely. I'm going to sneak one more question in, Sarah. Yeah, go ahead. I know it's almost almost time, and I, I'm sure there are a lot of questions for Nathaniel. So th this is a kind of writer-to-writer -writer question. I want to know what it took from you to write this book, and also what the writing gave to you. I mean, I, I have such admiration for you as a writer, because your writing is beautiful, but the journey you took, Nathaniel, to write this, could, could you talk a little about that? Well, thank you, Gail. Um, so I write in lots of forms. And um, I write fiction, I write novels, I write uh, critical essays. I've written various forms of criticism over the years. I've written nonfiction that's often about place, interpreting place. I write about history that's sort of built into that. And so by nature, my writing has always been very lower C Catholic. Um, that is, when I write fiction, I'm also writing an essay. I just was thinking about this today. In fact, my novel, um, Everything is Borrowed, is in a real sense a kind of essay and a history, as well as being a work of fiction. And so to me, it's all about writing. And there are just slight gradations of difference in the way you might emphasize something. So um, I hope that you'll get a chance to read To Reach the Spring. And if you do, you'll see that it's filled with literature. Because when I need to think, I read. And reading is the very basis for my writing. And I will say that, so this is a book of thinking. And I mean it as a vessel, as a thing to think along with. Because one of the problems that we, we have is that we, we're really having trouble thinking about this issue. It's too vast. It's too horrible. It's not immediate enough. It's too immediate. And therefore, we're in crisis. You know, can imagine being in a forest fire. Can't think when the forest is burning. So any of those things are happening. And what I'm trying to do here is take a pause and say, we have a moment. It's fleeting. But let's try to think together. And I don't expect readers to necessarily agree with my conclusions or have the same kind of emphasis or thought that I do. But I do hope that what comes out of it is a joint act of thinking, that we can talk and think together. Uh, and um, so that's why like being here at Walden tonight is so important because we're thinking with Henry David Thoreau. We're continuing a conversation that he continued. I mean, he gets a lot of uh, kudos for starting conversations too, but he also was continuing them within the milieu of, of New England of his time. And we're continuing that. And Gail, you're continuing that. And Sarah, you're continuing that with the work of, of the Walden Woods. And I'm hoping to continue that as well. It's like, we're just stretching along here this this never ending but increasingly acute conversation about what what's happening so mm -hmm. that's the role of the writer is is just to help that along is to frame things in ways that maybe you don't normally think about or mm -hmm. i mean even turns of phrase can be so powerful in helping to trigger something the reason I wrote this in such a personal way was for that reason, is that it is incredibly personal to me. Everyone who knows me knows that I'm a very reticent person and I don't really write about myself very often, but this was a way for me to reflect on my own most usually uh, insignificant and sometimes even harmful attempts to follow beliefs with action in regard to the earth over the over the over the years five decades and um and reflect on that reflect on the different opportunities i've had 
personally. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for doing that, Nathaniel. And I, I, I predict and hope <laughs> that this will not only will many, many people read it, and also many writers will be inspired and encouraged by your words to also write. Mm-hmm. Um, thank so you, Gail. Thank you so much. And this is perfect. I pass the yeah. torch <laughs> to you, our Sarah. <laughs> thank you, Gail. And great um, last question too, because it is so comparable to what you know Thoreau was doing through his writing, not just as a tool, but writing to figure out life, to think about life, not yep. necessarily figure it out, but um, to think about yep. life. And those thoughts were often, you know, changing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So with that, um, everyone, I know we can't see you, but if you have questions, type them into the Q&A box and I will read them to Nathaniel and Gail. Uh, we already have a few, so I'll jump right in. Um, do you think the next generation of adults, say those 10 to 15 now, will embrace the need for change or will they simply adapt to the new normal, more pandemics, more severe summers, more extreme storms, more fires, etc.? A great question, and uh, and I would say the only possible way of answering it is to say, you know, to what degree will this coming generation follow point possibility A, and to what degree will they follow possibility B? Because of course it's going to be a, a combination of things. So it is incredibly notable that, to me anyway, having my, uh, as you know from the reading that I just did, my my children are young adults. And um, so they're part of, they're not quite as young as the questioner was asking, but they're part of this generation that really politically gets it. Mm -hmm. And they see it for what it is exactly. That's why these social movements today are so powerful is that they're so clear eyed. And they're also a little bit, frankly, angry at what the rest of us have done to their world. So, so I think there's, I mean, we're already seeing, we're already seeing that young people are energized and activated to a degree that hasn't been seen since possibly around the year I was born, which was 1969. My age cohort was, hor- and I write about this in the book, horribly, apathetic. In fact, apathy was a virtue in the Reagan years. And so this group of young people, they get it and they have a different consciousness. I talk about uh, talking to, the, the book ends with a sixth grade classroom. So, and I didn't have to bring these ideas to them. I just gave them some ways of thinking or ways to think about thinking um, through expansion of consciousness, but they had it all already. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, really hopeful and impressed by the young people, even those aged, you know, so sixth graders are exactly in that range that the questioner asked 10 to 15. So hopeful. But I also think that we're talking about an earth filled with what will be 10 billion human beings. And a extraordinary large amount of those people live from hand to mouth. Hand to mouth is even an exaggeration in terms of global poverty. Um, the ability to choose how to act is limited. And so I think the many, many millions of people are going to be forced to adapt. And I do think that as a species, we've seen it in one eight month span, the extraordinary ways in which we all have adapted. And we've become, unfortunately, both more, I mean, in some ways we've become much more interior creatures. Mm -hmm. This whole remote thing is like, that's an adaptation, a very powerful one because we're not together really. 
but at the same time, we're also learning that we like it's safer to be outside. So I think there's there's mm -hmm. hope in our adaptations too. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, next question: How, in a country that made such a heavy political and financial investment in an interstate highway system and the inter internal combustion engine, and in a time of such ideological divide? not to mention profound congressional gridlock, can you find your way to a hope for policy that would turn the momentum of climate change around? That was a mouthful, but if you need to re I mean, repeat it, I can. No, no, that's a brilliant question. And it is, I mean, I think it's the, the thing about that question is it must be asked and it must be answered with the most sobriety possible. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when we answer it, we end up, taking away our agency because it seems so daunting and so impossible. One of the problems that we face is exactly what's um, uh, reflected in this question. And that is most of us are trapped. We are in the way this country particularly and some other places on earth too are built the spatial design of this country is to make us dependent in order to get from point A to point B on fossil fuels. And there's almost no other way to do it. So if you imagine that there was a, a massive ad campaign for um, walk to work, don't drive to work, that would be impossible, literally impossible for most people. Mm -hmm. Only some seven or 8% of Americans live in dense enough cities where that would even be possible. So the questioner is really onto something. This is, I, I don't know, but, I, but, but I would also say that it seemed impossible at every step. When I think about the fact that enslavement was ended, when I think about the mid, the antebellum age abolitionists, 1830s, 40s, and 50s, those who saw not only decreasing political hope, because man, it seemed impossible, um, but also worsening policy. It was getting worse. 1850, Fugitive Slave Act, that kind of thing. When, when you think that yet, Enslavement did end, it took a war, but it did end. And we, we do have the capacity to move towards something better. We really do. We've proven it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the kids, ref the kids right, see right through that. And so they're tired of the bullshit, frankly, right. that says we can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you touched on this a little bit, Nathaniel, but um, Gail, I think you can answer this too. Any writers or activists that you look up to, um, that you turn to? Oh, there. Go ahead, Nathaniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, I mean, I, I want to be careful about my response to this. So first of all, I will say that um, Greta Thunberg, mm -hmm. I mean, we must, we must make space to acknowledge what she has done as a very young person in the way that says, we're sick of your bullshit. And she really has become a prophet. And in the book, I sort of equate her to, to those abolitionists of the 1830s and 1840s who were working within a landscape where they were seen as the freaks, just as she's made out to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think when it all is said and done, she will be one. But I don't want us to lose sight and get too, I don't want us to become too Eurocentric about this. That is, across the world, including in the United States, particularly the most uh, exciting resistance work, the most exciting political organizing, the most um, 
powerful acts are by indigenous peoples in this country and uh, in Asia and in the Americas particularly. And the work they are doing, because, you know, I think a lot of us feel like colonization was a thing of the 19th century, even the 18th century, this, and we live with its remnants because so many governments overthrew finally their colonizers and they got agency over their countries back. But in fact, colonization is real across the world. And what it means is it's not only just a cultural or political colonization, but now it's deeply aligned with extraction. And I can give a real quick example of activists in a place where I was in South America in Chile who are Mapuche people. Mapuche were the last indigenous group to be colonized in the Americas. It didn't happen until midway through the 19th century. And those people, for them, they are still fighting to save their forests. They're still fighting to save their water and their, and their rights to their water. They're against multinational corporations and a, a neoliberal government that sort of gives it all away to corporations. Logging, mineral rights, cattle raising, all of this, and they're on the front lines. We're literally, they're on the front lines. We're still talking about organizing to save their communities and their ways of life, not to mention like the cultural things like language and tradition. And the, their greatest symbol is a, a tree that happens to be one of the endangered species of the world. So you see the way that those are the people, and it's happening in the Amazon too, as I write in this book, th those are the people we look to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with Nathaniel. All my heroines and so forth are the people I work with in, in, the, in the global south who are on the front lines every day, all day long, stopping early childhood marriage, you know, in the AIDS infested drought, northern parts of Kenya and the people who led the Arab Spring and who are still, uh, still committed to that. I think the question's beautiful because those are the people who give me hope. Exactly. The, the, yep. the, to many, Nathaniel alluded many times that we don't see it in our news because it's such a propaganda machine, but actually all day long, hundreds and thousands of people are doing amazing good works. Um, so that, that, that gives me hope. I mean, an environmental heroine was Wangari Matai and we still work with her um, foundation uh, with with the women in Africa. So a lot of people are are out there every day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I love that you both bring up people that you know are not the household names <laughs> that we often hear about. It's really important um, to think of, to think that way and to understand that. For one, we think we have all the agency in the world. Mm -hmm. But in fact, those who are already facing severe ecological uh, emergency in various ways, um, they're, they're the ones who are already doing the work right. and making the alliances and fighting against all odds. And so it's, there, it's, it's, it's them we need to ally with. Mm -hmm. It's really and important. And learn from, right? And learn, and learn from, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yep. quite exactly. And and we and we do that by reading, as as you've said, um, and absorbing all that. Um, next question: Would activists get more bang for their buck by focusing their attention on corporations, not governments? Gail, you might have some thoughts no on way, this. No way, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nathaniel, you take that one. Well, I think it's, I think it's a, a yes and. Um, it, 
I'm not sure it needs to be both. I mean, the fact is that governments regulate corporations. So that's harder in the United States because of Citizens United said that any political speech is free speech, including that which is represented by the spending of money. So that gives powerful corporations a lot more speech in terms of weight on policy. So, and I think that really sort of the, I think that you can get corporations to change their behaviors and they do, and it can be significant, but ultimately I think in probably every realm we can think about, the effect is limited and it's limited in, in time until attention is taken somewhere else. On the other hand, when I was in that sixth grade classroom and we were thinking through, this class was aligned with a project called Need Indeed where they're working with, that they work with in order to kind of um, imagine a social justice issue that they as a group of students can get involved in through their classroom. And so they chose plastic pollution. And they were trying to think about what they can do as 12 year olds to, um, reduce, to, to reduce plastic pollution, which by the way is out of control now because of COVID. But, and I, I just learned that by 2050, there'll be more plastic than fish in the ocean. So, so these kids get it and they wanted to figure out, well, what can they do? And they said, all right, well, they can start lobbying city council or they could start lobbying the school district and, and, and get, and they're part of a massive school district. So it involved literally hundreds of schools and, and, and lots of students. So, and lot, and you know, you could have actual pretty vast um, impact or do you go to the convenience store chains and get, Mr. Head Guy or Ms. Head Guy to say, we're going to stop giving away plastic bags that are used on average for 12 minutes until they're thrown into to the trash. And so I, so I would say it's both. I mean, we, we need to, this, uh, the, a, a miracle just happened. The, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers denied the permit for a mine in Alaska called the Pebble Mine that had been sought by the most powerful mining company in the world. And that only probably, I mean, and it's how that happened at the end of the Trump administration when we're all expecting a whole bunch of rulings to go exactly the opposite way can only be because activists made it so clear that the mine plan had no, nothing of redeeming value to it. And it's because the pressure was put on the government and the, co and the company. Mm. And that the, and I forget the name of the company, but it's, it's one of the most horrible environmental actors in the world. That company gets exposed in ways that become dangerous to that company. And the government and the regulatory body gets exposed and pushed. So both end. Mm. Yeah, great, great answer. Um, it's almost like you had it planned, but I know you, I know you didn't. <laughs> Not true. Um, <laughs> we do have a few more minutes, so um, just folks who want to enter their questions, we'll try to get to them all, so feel free to type them in the box. Um, before you said that place is often influential in your work was place um, influenced the same way in this book or or was it different great question so um, differently so uh, I have written at length from a journalistic historical contemporary architecture perspective about the city where I live, which is Philadelphia. And, and it's a way in which I can write about it from a perspective of the way the past and future intersect on the streets of a city, you can read it, it's legible. And it's kind of a way I have of thinking about place and all the ways in which place gets animated. Um, there's a material aspect and there's a cultural aspect and, and, and the like. And of course there's people. 
in this, it's, it's much more, in fact, personal. Mm. It's not so abstract. It's personal. So the ways in which place intersects in this book are me. I've lived most of my life, not all of it, but most of it, very near to the Delaware River, mm. a river named for a colonizing person, Lord Delaware. Um, and I've swam in it. I, I swim in it. I drink the water from it. Like the Delaware is, you know, whatever's in that water is inside me. And so my first ability to be conscious of the environment was related to that river and to the forest that still exists in and around it. And my life today is set up to to be able to interact with it in that way, to, to still swim in the river, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, place is also gets evoked here um, in the time I spent in Michigan in the early 90s um, in, in, a, in really where you could sort of see the post-industrial landscape and the way you could see it quite horrifyingly and horribly was in the amount of cancer that was in people I knew intimately and their families. So, uh, and so I got to see the different aspects of place because I ran an environmental canvas, excuse me, in Southeastern Michigan in and around the Detroit suburbs, um, and then later up, um, up in Lansing. And so, A, I got to learn the landscape by walking it, neighborhood after neighborhood. But I also got to understand the demographic landscape overlapping it, class stratification, which was very clear when you go to a neighborhood filled with General Motors executives and you're there to campaign for um, a toxic right to know law or whatever, you know, you're going to get a different reception. And, and, um, and so it was really interesting to be able to interpret place through an environmental lens. Mm -hmm. In, in that, and that's what I got because everything was focused on the environment in my time that I lived in Michigan. That's why I was there. That's how, that's, that was the lens I saw the world through. And it was a little bit of a different one than I was used to in a place where I grew up, which was to say where I, where everything was embedded into the place. Yeah. Not just that. Yeah. That's great. Um... So the questions have stopped, but we do have comments that I want to share since I know you can't see them. Um, Kate says she just got the news about Alaska too. So happy that we're all here to say it, uh, hear it at the same time. Um, and a remark from earlier, hearing Gail's endorsement, how can we not read this important book? Um, which is, I, I think is a great, um, a great way to end. So any, any lasting um, comments, Nathaniel or Gail? Well, a book or anything? <laughs> I, I would just say that um, this is my first book to come out in the COVID era. Um, and though I've sat through events and meetings on Zoom often enough over the last eight months, uh, this is the first time that I was presenting something like this. And I'm just so grateful that we could all be together somehow. Yeah. I'm grateful that when um, it was proposed to you, Sarah, that you were open to it. And Gail, I'm so grateful for your reading and your words. Um, to have the birth of this book tied to your work and not just the Ashokan landscape, but also your work in terms of the global south and women's empowerment it's really part of all of this we're all we're talking about justice here and then tying it further back to henry david thoreau um, it means so much it this is just me putting some words together that hopefully can be resonant in some way 
somewhere to someone and it's all always done in the spirit of conversation mm -hmm. what i write is connected to what you write is connected mm -hmm. and so on and so that's so well represented here tonight and i'm so thankful for it um and i hope that um you know I, people have not gotten too sick of hearing my voice <laughs> since i can go on yeah no i think um i i think nathaniel um you've perfectly um demonstrated this idea of conversation in in your writing and tonight and i i know i speak for all of us i wish you the best in the launch i hope there are lots and lots of events and um it, it, you know one thing we were talking with sarah just before we started about how you skated this very like a tightrope in this book between giving us the truth, no bullshit, like the generation coming up is teaching us, and yet not too much. Mm -hmm. And I want to just congratulate you on that. And if there's still time, how did you do that? Was that like a barometer inside yourself? Well, one of the problems that I identify in the book about our capacity to face this, which I call paralysis, mm -hmm. is that we can't hold a conversation when the spotlight is on us, when things seem so dire. Mm -hmm. It's it when things seem so dire, then we lose our sense of agency. Now, a dear friend of mine, who is a physician, last night she sent me a couple journal articles which are about end of life care and the ways in which faced with the mortality of our own selves or family members, so very often we go to any length possible to save a life. Mm -hmm. And there is now emerging some scholarship on this idea that though we're only indirectly related mostly most of us i mean if your house burnt down in california because of, or siberia because of a fire you might not feel like you're adjacent to the problem but most of us are still feeling or at least telling ourselves that we're adjacent to the problem so can we channel that sense of empathy for the life into helping to, to, to beat back the worst of what might come. Can we channel that? Even though we're still kind of adjacent to the patient, mm -hmm. we're not quite the patient yet. And that's a challenge. So um, I was just reading today about, you know, how that's how, how the messaging around COVID and Thanksgiving didn't work, right? People traveled some ridiculous number of people traveled to be with family. And so now there's a reassessment of, okay, you can't, you can't beat people over the head with it. We have to find new ways of enticing people to do what's right for them and for their communities and stay home. And so that's the thing. And also who wants to read a book of misery? <laughs> uh, I mean, even Primo Levi inside of Auschwitz could not only live in misery. <laughs> he found humor, tremendous amount of humor. So, so must we. Mm -hmm. So must we. Well said. That's a really great way to end. Yeah, absolutely. I wish I had a joke to follow with, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you both. Um, so much. Um, this was a really generous conversation and I know our participants think so too. Um, they are commenting and thanking you both. Um, and thank you to our participants. Thanks to those who keep coming to our virtual events. Um, on an end note, it is Giving Tuesday. Um, and if you have the ability, we hope you'll make a contribution no matter how big or small to the Walden Woods Project. Um, I posted a link in the chat if anyone um, wants to do that but mostly we're just really grateful for all of you who um came 
and participated by just listening or asking questions. And one last reminder to scroll up in the chat and to, I'll actually just post the link again to order um, Nathaniel's book from um, Bookshop. And I'll just say, sorry, we have a few more minutes. I will yeah. just say <laughs> that what Sarah just said, I mean, everyone should donate to Walden Woods if you haven't already. Um, it's Giving Tuesday, but it's also just, a, we, we, one of the things that I keep inside of me is, is Italo Calvino saying in, um, in his great book, Invisible Cities, that is, what we must do is, is push to the side that which is the inferno that might engulf us, which may be, in fact, a real inferno mm -hmm. in the Amazon or California or Siberia, wherever, and make room for that which, it is, not, which is not the inferno. Mm, wow. Walden Woods is not the inferno. I saw someone in the chat, some of the messages are coming up. So I saw someone saying they stood up to, to, to developers. I didn't read the whole thing, but I saw that. Like, that's making room for not the inferno. That's making room for a world of, of sharing the world with other creatures and making space for living mm -hmm. and life. And that's what we must do. Mm -hmm. Yep, our organization started um, because part of Walden Woods was going to be bought um, for a commercial building. Um, and as local folks know, Concord uh, residents, we're not, um, we're not about to let that happen. And with the help of other um, people like Don Henley, uh, Kathy Anderson, our CEO, um, we're what still, year was we're that, still here. Sarah? This was 1990. 1990. Uh -huh. and, yep, it's, and a, it's a pretty amazing a story. To I mean, uh, your part system. of the world has some of the most amazing um, interventions in terms of zoning and the, and the yeah. making room for, for uh, wild lands and forests and everything. And so that doesn't surprise me. But mm -hmm. I mean, it was only 10 years since, um, since Calvino wrote that in 1982, I believe, mm -hmm. and not even 10 years. And, and so the, and what he was seeing was a world that was going to be exactly what was avoided at Walden Woods. Mm -hmm. Endless concrete, sprawling concrete. Mm -hmm. So, th so there it is. Yeah. At least yeah. we make space. Yeah. 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 Very important. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you all. Well, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you, Gail and Nathaniel. Congrats, Nathaniel. Thank you. Congratulations. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.